Hi, I'm Jim Birch. Uh, I'm a Renault Virginia artist, and this is my shed of Doug Consciousness. Uh, follow me. This is a painting that uh, I made New Babylon. Um, uh, it's basically kind of an abstract, but most of them are. It's uh, acrylic and pastel. And I, I, I found out, I just basically just found out about pastels and found out that they don't work really well on canvas, but you can kind of paint behind them, they just stay longer. Um, this basically, the lyrics are the animals are running through a jungle and then tucked away to sleep in peace on the hills of aging bones. That came from a song I wrote in 1993 or 94. Um, it was basically about the destruction of our environment, and basically this is how I saw um, how uh, humans are going into nature and the animals have nowhere to go. Uh, that's the end all be all to it. Uh, you're, you're seeing a lot more bears and deer and badgers and everything else running into the streets nowadays. They really have nowhere to go, and that was how I was inspired to do this one. This was the one I painted right before we did the show. I was just basically inspired. This is basically a total musical beat. Well, they're all musical pieces. This one is called Polarized Dove. And I went back to an old form of, of doing it. Um, I did use brushes uh, in some parts of it. In others, I used chalk pen. And I don't think I used anything else. I can switch it and fill it chalk pen. But uh, it's, it's kind of a musical piece, but basically it's about the direction. And if you take a look closely, you see blue, red, that's the main feature. You also see all kinds of other colors, and that's basically the world around it and, and how they are affected by it. So uh, it's had a lot to do with our collection this year. This one, I wish I knew I, how to explain to you how I created this piece. Um, it's called We Go Where We Want To. You can you notice there's a soul sign on it. Um, it really didn't sell. I, I'm in love with it and I don't want to sell it. Um, a lot of people that came in for my opening uh, saw it as a portal. And maybe that's the reason I like it so much. I didn't, it looks like, you know, maybe you can leap through it. Um, this is an acrylic and a pastel. Um, this took a lot of unique work. Um, Basically, it's it's basically you're putting a certain two or three colors down and letting them soak into the canvas for about 60 or 70 percent of the time, and then you're taking uh, paint on top of that, and then you're letting that sit for about 50 percent of the time, and then uh, and then basically I scrape away what I want, and then I added pastels to it, and but basically, I knew you know the white was one of the first things that I put down, and uh, blue and black, and I, I did it in such a way that I knew that I wanted to keep a ghostly effect to it. It was probably one of the hardest paintings that I've ever done, um, but it came out exactly the way I wanted. Um, and I guess my sense of humor appears because I got Willy Walker right here. I got. My kids were really into 21 Pilots, so I put the cat in 21 Pilots there with the green face, and then I put a Martian Betty from Riverdale right there for the Archie and Jughead comics. That is a uh, you ever want to. I won't go into a lighting too much. Um, this is the first time I ever used pastels. I did use acrylics also, but I screwed up the painting. And uh, so I just basically had to get rid of all the acrylics, and then I, I saw that something was happening. And then I just, again, I'd never used pastels in my life. And so I just basically went ahead and just started using pastels. And I have a friend who's a Palestinian. And I added these little things with chalk pen, kind of kind of to in tribute to the Palestinian cause. Not that I'm against uh, people from Israel, but I do feel bad for Palestinians. And I feel that they need a home like everybody else. The reason it's named Eliding is, at the very end of it, a little birdie appeared. So it's a light. This next piece is called Orgasmic. It started off as uh, I was going to do a rooster or a chicken. And that's where you see right here. And um, basically, uh, I can use things besides paintbrushes. This is definitely one that I've been using paintbrushes on. Um, I remember somebody asked me if I ran paint, which I find very soulless. Uh, I find it. I, you know, I'm 
I'm totally against that. Um, I, I, if, if something, uh, if I'm working on something with chopsticks, or in, in this case, I use the nail, um, I might maneuver it like this and then place it back down because every painting that I paint is flat on the floor. And it just started to turn into something else and I started to see bodies. I just started to see bodies everywhere. Bodies doing things. And so I named Orgasmo. Uh, I didn't want to name it anything else. And uh, it's a pretty interesting piece. Um, this next one is uh, Mirazelle's. It's personal. Um, my dad had a flower shop for years. He was a uh, he was an illustrator and a writer, but I had to work for him for years, and I'm talking about like 13 on. And so, Dad's birthday was December 12th last year, and I, I painted this in tribute to my father. Um, if there's any black or brown in this art, uh, piece of work, it probably was because uh, sometimes he and I would get into it. Um, but basically, he was. He was trained in European design, and uh, he, he actually trained under somebody in Hollywood, California, and some of his clients were Elizabeth Taylor, Debbie Reynolds, um, Eddie Fisher, just some of the big stars of the early 60s, uh, especially during that Cleopatra time period, or actually, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember the Eddie Fisher, Richard Burton thing, but yeah, Liz Taylor was a big client, so, but uh, this is in tribute to my father, who was the best European uh, floral designer in Rome. Um, so that's Mary's Ellis. This one took some time. This one took a little bit of time. Um, again, all my work is musically influenced. Um, this one basically, uh, I was missing a surf record uh, really bad and I found it on YouTube. It's just basically second rate surf bands, instrumentals from the early 60s, no big names. But the record is called New Wave Surf Party. I don't know why. It was the 60s. I just listened to it over and over and over And so I called this one Space Race because uh, it just kind of fit the time a period. And it started off with this, again, uh, chopsticks and all that stuff. The entire background, I'm not going to go into detail about how I did it, but I, because uh, you know, we all have our secrets, but I did not use a paintbrush. Um, and I just created space, and then at the very end, I had to get the brush out. I didn't want to do big circles because this thing is sort of circles. A lot of people uh, tie it into astrology. Um, I'm, I'm happy that they're doing that, but uh, to me, it's just it's just basically uh, it's just what came out of my head. You know, off certain music called reverb. This is the one that uh, the ladies in all the gallery like the most uh, here at Gallery 202. It's called Revelry. Uh, and they all said the same thing to me, which I thought was really strange. It said, this is like something your mother might have done had she done more abstract work. And I'll be frank, uh, it, it, it got me a little bit, because my mother was going to play cards, we discussed that later. Uh, I was actually going to, I was using up some colors that I didn't want, and uh, I was going to basically rip it. I was just going to get streaked the next day. I was going to take it apart and see what I could do. And I woke up the next morning and I came in and I said, you know, oh my God, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna touch this. Um, when I was painting it, which was like around two in the morning after the work, um, I started to, I don't know, I felt like somebody was guiding me. This was the first of works where I felt like there was maybe a spirit guiding me through it. And if a spirit was guiding me through this one, it was definitely my mother. Um, I'm a spiritual guy, I'm a religious guy, but I am a spiritual guy. And this one, I think I have help with. That's all I can say about it. But yeah, the ladies in the studio, all the artists here, uh, when we're hanging it, they love that one the most. So then we come to one called Tranquilizer. Tranquilizer was also influenced by listening to a lot of dub reggae music and surf instrumentals. Um, I had seen a picture of a friend of mine, I hadn't seen him in about 10 years, and I saw what heroin and narcotics, legalized narcotics can do to a human being. A uh, picture was posted of him. He's very private. And I immediately did this, and I did this in one swoop. Um, no brushes were used in this. Um, so I kind of, I tried to lighten it up. I make it kind of sound surfy, but at the same time, tranquilizer was basically about my friend. And 
literally what it does to your brain, what it does to your body over 25 or 30 years. And uh, so that was a major influence in doing this piece. And that's why a lot of red and black are in there. This piece right here, it's a small piece. Um, it's called Dead Celebrity Cult. Um, somehow, I don't know, I was on, on the line, so sometimes you can really have a text, which is something I don't know. Um, it's not my text, it's just basically celebrity in general. I keep thinking of like Gloria Swanson, you know. And basically, um, there was a body in the casket all, and it's up and everything. And then if you look very closely, there's what was once the beautiful uh, engraved that's, that's floating out of the body. And, uh, I find it a really interesting piece. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty happy with it. I don't have much more to say about it, but it also is just basically why why are we so affected by celebrities? I just really like the classic that I like the new people and like that, so I think it's more of a more responsive to Jane and Nancy or something like that. This one, uh, this one's called Dennis Hopper's All Right and I Can Get. Um, I basically call it all right, and I sent it to my brother uh, a picture of it. My brother said, "What's your name, Dennis Hopper?" And I was like, and uh, I said, "No, I'm just name Dennis Hopper's going to right now." Um, I honestly don't know how I did this. Uh, I didn't use paintbrushes except around the tires a little bit, and I did use paintbrushes on the mountain, and of course I used. Uh, paintbrushes to cut that off with a few other techniques. This I use like space rakes, I use the background that I don't want to talk about. Um, I did use a little bit of paintbrushes just to black out the areas where the paint. I did let it fall over a day. Um, I did have somebody tell me, uh, or they didn't tell me, but I heard somebody speak of his painting and think that it was a uh, tribute to fast food because they saw ketchup, mayonnaise, and mustard. Uh, I thought, well, if you think that way, I think that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm not a fast food eater. I'm actually very, very against it. But uh, yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be also labeled as uh, tribute to fast food. That's that's not just my idea. This one is a straight up dub reggae. That's all I listen to. I mean, I, I went through the whole thing to uh, to dub, which is a very trippy kind of music. And you get in the zone, and I used a lot of paint on this. And, and basically, it really was chopsticks all the way. I don't really like to talk about that, it's chopsticks. But I do use them, and, and I create faces as I go along. You have to move very quickly with your work. You just don't do that. It didn't take me one day, it pretty much took me a week to do this. I had to do it in pieces, and uh, I was really attracted to certain colors, uh, like melon. Uh, something called Ocean Breeze, just really cheap paint, which maybe I shouldn't have used acrylic uh, wise, but, um, but I was really in the zone on this one. And uh, I wanted to use as many colors as I could, and I just wanted to use the blue and technical. So that's called Frenetic Dove version 2. This one's called Vanquisher. Um, I may be the only person on the planet, the person who bought it, um, that loves this piece. Um, I basically. Uh, I read a lot about archaeology, and especially in South America and Central America. And you know, Vanquisher is a warrior. And so, uh, again, I didn't really touch, I didn't use a lot of brushes on this. I actually, actually used knives and stuff on some of this stuff. Uh, I, and for once, I talked about not using running paint. I did use running paint right there, right there. And uh, I basically flowed paint down into the series. And, and did a, use a brush on the face a little bit to, to make a face. But basically, the vanquisher is the warrior right here, and then everything behind it is uh, the bodies he had to kill, the hunting he had to do for his family. Uh, there's a fish. Uh, there's there's all kinds of stuff working with this. And uh, one of my daughters pointed out that uh, that looks like a little Hello Kitty uh, character, but uh, no, uh, I wasn't really into Hello Kitty at all. Uh, but uh, this is a personal favor of mine. This is probably different than the rest of my work. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail about how I think it. I did use a brush for the sand, and I did use a brush for the paint right here. Um, and I did outline 
what the bot, what, what I did with the paint and the computer to make the arms and everything. But literally, I did use the back end of the paintbrush to do his arms. And again, I worked flat on the floor. I don't, I, if I use an easel, I've done everything I do. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I finger painted the black ocean behind uh, the gentleman, and then uh, the sky was also kind of um, And it's called a King of Property. It's, it's a different piece. All right, this next one is called a Rockabilly Meltdown. Um, I've spent my entire life being obsessed by 50s music, and when I was in high school, uh, Rockabilly took over to the point where I scoured the ends of the earth for the most obscure artists in the world. And I thought to myself, going into it, that I wanted to do something kind of psychedelic with, with Rockabilly and with some of the colors to it. And this is how it came out. Um, I did put the blue and the pink in there, and then I shook it. I just shook it. And then I went back in and started using chopsticks and stuff. And then I did have to use a brush. I uh, got a little Betty Page looking woman right here. Don't really understand the Betty Page fascination. She was not known in the 50s. You know, Jane Mansfield, Mamie Van Doren, Aaron Monroe, and more. I know every heifer. But uh, yeah, I did the Betty Page, the whole Betty Page thing. And uh, if you were to get closer to it, you can start to see the makings of uh, a rockabilly dude. But that's really up to you. I like the little ice cream man at the top. Um, but I had a lot of fun with this, and um, that's essentially it for that one. So here we are with Preaching the Blues. Uh, probably the least liked from the ladies at the gallery. But the situation here is uh, it is a protest piece all the way. Um, a friend of mine sent me a video on Facebook or somewhere like that on this pastor from Tennessee, who's no more than maybe 32, uh, preaching the most heinous, white supremacist Christianity stuff I've ever heard. I don't know what Bible this guy's preaching from, but one thing he said to me that stuck with me was this, and that was uh, when uh, Jesus comes down in the second coming, he's gonna be carrying a machine gun, he's gonna be killing Muslims. That's how this came about. Um, basically, I did. I wanted an alley style background and graffiti piece. So basically, I did the background uh, first. It what it is acrylic, and it was uh, some kind of what do they call it? Triple, triple. You can speak for it. A chisel. Yeah, yeah, paint chisel. And I just went up and I let the paint dry, seventy five percent, and then I went up and down with it because I wanted mostly red, but I wanted other colors in the background. Of course, I hand painted preaching the blues in there. And of course, I, I brought, and there's silver crosses in there. I did with brushes and never painted a gun in my life. I did it right off the top of my head. Never painted a gun. Uh, and, but I painted that gun by God, I did. You know. So this is called Preaching the Blues. My mother and I explained Mary Jane Birch passed away uh, in 2016. Uh, I, I think I painted this three days after she passed and then didn't paint for a little while. Um, it's called 1979. I tried, I think that was the time period when she was uh, uh, pretty big. Uh, we were living in New Jersey and she, she, was, she was even kind of known up there. So it was kind of interesting to have somebody who was pretty uh, critically acclaimed that was known out of uh, Virginia because we had moved from Virginia to New Jersey. And I painted what I consider a blue angel. I finger painted this whole thing. I'm just going to be straight up. I just did, I did the whole thing with my fingers, and actually I took a stone and did a few things on there, but everything else was my fingers, and I did, I did paint for a while. This one's called 1979. This one's called the bouquet. It took me a long time to paint it. Um, just for some weird reason, I wanted to use different colors, so I decided to use neon acrylic, and I think I was a little cash because uh, Sometimes I'd have to use different kinds of paints and stuff like that to try and finish it out uh, until I got paid again. and didn't want to ask anybody for money for this. But um, I just really, it's basically, uh, um, I wanted to use a lot of faces. It's certainly something that if you look at, you're going to see faces and faces and faces. And like a lot of my work, I like faces and I like them to appear. And I want the person to be able to see those faces. Um, and that's how it came out. 
Um, some people like these colors and some people don't, so I knew that I was, if anything, I, I'm appealing to someone who likes really, really bright colors. All right, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. It's called Shimmy. Uh, this is another one where um, basically I used a few kitchen utensils. Someone asked me if I used forks, and that's when I had to come out and say, no, I didn't use forks on this. Um, I actually used a plastic burn that I found at a hobby shop for the back. I painted it black, and then I just plopped and plopped and plopped a few white things, and that's how it came out. And then I finger painted uh, dancing figures. Uh, I do have a strange obsession with ooh, I do have a strange obsession with rabbits. So here is a super rabbit, getting ready to punch out a regular rabbit, and then I got a dancing rabbit right here. And uh, uh, no, I'm not influenced by Keith Haring. Someone said, "This is Keith Haring. Are you like Keith Haring?" I was like, "Well, it's Keith Haring, you know." Uh, but no, I, th I just basically uh, uh, not nothing against. It. Uh, just painted with my fingers again. This was uh, around the same time that, uh, not not too long after I did the other. This piece is called Madeline's Secret Garden. Um, I actually, no matter how pretty you think it is, I painted this out of pain. Um, I got some bad news on my eight-year-old child um, that I'm still fighting through, but this was some extra bad news. Uh, I share 50-50 with custody. I might as well say that out loud. Um, but I was very, very upset. I did this in one day, and again, this is one of those pieces where I think somebody in my head, maybe my mother, maybe somebody close to me, uh, said, if you're going to paint, use her name in it. Do not paint a dark piece. Make it as beautiful as possible. Um, there is black in it. I, again, there was, I was very upset. I did put a cross in it, and I think it was because I just wanted her to be protected. Um, and a lot of, but um, basically, uh, except for the background, no brushes. Uh, again, I was very upset, and, uh, but it actually came out to be a pretty piece. Uh, it seems like a lot of people like this. This one's called Reverberate. Um, it's a four foot by four foot. It took me forever. I, I, it, I don't, uh, maybe a week, maybe longer. Um, I had to do it in increments. Um, I had a real good time with this. This is definitely a dub inspired piece. Also, uh, I was listening to a lot of Gorillaz. Um, uh, not their regular records, but all, all those crazy wild good remixes that you can find on YouTube. Um, and they do a lot of dub sides and everything. I think Damon Aldorn from uh, the Gorillaz is a big fan of that kind of music because it really filters in. Um, uh, another person asked me, did I run paint on this? No. Uh, I did it in increments. I really wanted faces to come through. I was very inspired. I was very positive when I painted this. Um, I wanted kind of a night sky at the, at the top and then uh, almost a tree as I went around. But this is really, of all my paintings, this is the epitome of dub and reggae and music in general. Um, and again, uh, a hearty thanks to Damon Alvarn, uh, the gorillas and the good, the bad, and the queen because I was very influenced by him on this one. And, uh, and it, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a story behind that that I will not talk about, but, uh, but uh, yes, this is called Reverberate. Well, that was my show. Um, I'm just gonna describe myself the best I can. Um, I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan lived there for a short time, then my parents decided to go back and finish out their degrees at Greenland School of Art down in Sarasota, Florida, and so we moved down there and then we moved to Rhino, Virginia. My mother was born in Rocky Mount, Virginia, and my father was born in Michigan, so it was kind of like the best of both worlds. And uh, I've spent most of my life in Rhino, except for some, I, I did live in New Jersey and North Carolina for a short time. Now, my childhood was basically uh, different than other children. Um, but, uh, my father was basically an illustrator, a writer, and an advertising guy before he got into the flower shop business. And my mother was straight up an artist. And so for my brother and I, it was basically, uh, you know, it was the 70s, so we got away with it. But my, you know, my mother would be in pigtails, bell bottoms that were coated in paint and a pair of sandals, you know. And uh, some people would look at us and, 
and they never cut our hair, so we basically had real long hair and stuff like that. I think my brother would like scream for a hairstyle and get some kind of Prince Valiant. Um, but we had a pretty cool childhood. We were allowed a lot of freedom. I was exposed to nature really early on because we lived out in the middle of nowhere at one time for like three years, and so we just run through the woods. And I became immune to like poison ivy, Virginia creeper. Um, you know, I got bit by a spider that made me really, really sick. I'm probably Black Widow. And uh, I decided not to be barefoot anymore in the woods. And, uh, but yeah, we were just allowed a, a lot of freedom. And even when we moved uh, in the, into Roanoke, well, we, even when we moved from the woods, um, I was on my bike at the age of seven, maybe three or four miles from the house. You know? and so we had a pretty cool uh, upbringing. Uh, I can't, the only negative was that we were always house poor. We never understood that we were house poor, but my parents or my father was really in the, being in the right neighborhood. And so basically we're, we had hand-me-down clothes and, and uh, hand-me-down bikes and uh, stereos and stuff. Um, I was born legally deaf and I don't know how I made it to second grade legally deaf, but um, I had to put it at the front of the class. They, my parents at first thought I was mentally handicapped. Um, and uh, you know, everything was like Charlie Brown. It's like whoop, 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 whoop. And so I spoke a different language, but as I got older and got closer in to people, I guess I understood how they talked and stuff. And then I had the ear surgery in second grade, and then my exposure to music came about. So all of a sudden, a new world opened up to me uh, in the second grade. And believe it or not, um, I was the only musician in the family. My brother had a tendency to, he could have been an artist. Um, he could also have been a writer. Um, I did illustration. The only art teacher I ever had was my mother because she did teach art classes when she wasn't having shows around the country and stuff like that. So basically, um, going through my parents' record collection was pretty dismal. Uh, but two records that I played over and over again and took over immediately was from each side of the family. My mother had the West Side Story soundtrack. And I, I just I, I ended, up, ended up watching the movie. And uh, I love the music in it, um, and uh, that was a big deal for me. And then my father had, here's Little Richard, the original. Now, just to say something about this record, this is not a greatest hits record, but it's here's Little Richard, it's the original, and here's, if you think about it, Tutti Fruity, True Fine Mama, Ready Teddy, Slippin' and Sliding, Long Tall Sally, Miss Ann, Rip It Up, Jenny Jenny, She's Got It. Those were all hits, all one man's record. Of course, Rolling Stone's not gonna talk about that. They'll start with Dylan and the Stones and the Beatles, but man, that's a lot of hits. And my mother, for some reason, was kind of an Elvis fan, and right before he died, she wanted to watch Jailhouse Rock, and she knew I liked music, so I watched Jailhouse Rock, and the movie was okay until you get to the part where the Jailhouse Rock sequence kind of came in, and I became an immediate fan, and that has lasted my entire life. Um, pretty much stopped liking Elvis's music around '62, and the and you know the movies were terrible, and then he became more terrible as he went on. He had a couple of good songs. I don't have the original record anymore, but I did have uh, his first record. But I gave it to my brother for helping me with something. But basically, I really loved his rockabilly music. I mean, so you you start out with "Don't Be Cruel" and all the hits. And then all of a sudden you got My Baby Left Me, Money Honey, uh, unbelievably awesome rockabilly music. To be honest with you, probably the best rockabilly artist. Um, I know a lot, of, and I love rockabilly. I, I know everything about it. But uh, yeah, I was a big Elvis fan. I still have this record. Um, that's about it for that. All right, so basically uh, uh, it's not just art and music. Um, I'm an avid book reader. I love movies. Um, first movie I recall seeing was King Kong, 1938 version. And so I like the classic movies. Um, I had cousins who did bad things, like their parents would take to see Jaws, and I was afraid to go in the water for a short time. Um, my favorite movie, I think to this day, is A Cloud of Orange. I think it's a work of art. It just doesn't really pertain to me painting. Uh, Facing the Crowd by Eli Kazan is another one. I think it's really awesome. Sunset Boulevard, Raves of Lost Heart. But I am a very avid reader, and my, I think with the help of my grandmother Birch and my mother and my father, I learned to read before I got my ears fixed. And uh, so I started reading at an early age, and uh, uh, probably have maybe three or four thousand books in it. Um, I just can't 
stop reading. Uh, books as pertaining to art, um, there's really only one. There's only one author, and I'm not, she's not even my favorite author. But I discovered her in late high school, I believe. She read the lottery, and um, she was a very private woman. They thought she was a witch after she read the lottery. I think that she was in Lady Sand Journal, and her name is Shirley Jackson. And she, they got so much hate mail over that story because they were so used to happy, clean stories. And here's one that was completely normal to the very ending. But um, I like uh, her novels, but I uh, like Haunted of Hill House. But um, Summer People and, and The Lottery were very important to me. And she stopped signing after The Lottery. So in order to get a signature from Shirley Jackson, who became very reclusive, um, you had to mail her the book. And then she would sign it and mail it back. And I was able to get a copy of a signed Shirley Jackson book. This is one of my prize collections. Um, uh, it's a second edition print of the lottery, but just to have her signature makes me feel closer to her. But the way she wrote and the psychological uh, um, horror and the phantasmagoric stuff, uh, it, 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 it subconsciously goes into my artwork. And uh, so we're going to go on. I, I'm going to try to make this quick. Uh, basically, my teen years, I became a punker. Um, uh, basically, the very first record I heard, uh, well, actually, I heard uh, one way or another, but uh, this is my favorite Blondie record. Uh, so I heard this, and everything that I ever heard before, like Billy Joel and Leo Sayer and all that stuff, I never wanted to hear ever again. This is a great record. Uh, and of course, that was the gateway. To other things. And as soon as I got into Blondie, uh, I heard Whip It. And I bought that record first, of course, Freedom of Choice, but Duty Now for Future. This is an awesome record. Uh, this is synthesizers, but yet the guitars are pretty heavy in this record. I consider it one of the great punk records and new wave records. Um, this is awesome. This is also, I have a special shirt on. I still have a Peter Pan complex when it comes to music. Um, I like their first record and this, this record equally, but this was probably my introduction to what I saw as the future of music. Uh, it was ska, it was uh, uh, elevator music, it was uh, dub reggae, and that was my first record. It's very strange, even the 50s influence into it. Um, I thought Jerry Dammer's the keyboardist, and I learned how to play organ. Um, was, it still is, one of my favorite keyboard players, but this just, it's like bouncing balls in your head. It's a great record. And hard to believe, I didn't listen, except for Light My Fire on WROVAM, um, I never heard The Doors until um, I was in junior high school. This is all junior high school, except for Blondie. I think I was in elementary school, but uh, this first Doors record goes along with the first Elvis RCA release and also uh, the first special, specials record, it's one of the greatest debut records I've ever heard. Um, I like their other albums, but this one just flows. I think there's a couple of crappy ones, 20th Century Fox, I didn't particularly like. But this whole album, and I, I actually have a lot of like my favorite fire, I don't know listen to that. But uh, yeah, this whole record is awesome, man. And uh, maybe I just delve too deeply. Maybe I'm cheesy, I don't know. So I get to high school, I'm starting to get angrier. Um, I don't know, I was going through hormonal things, manic depression, chemical imbalance, all that stuff. And I came across this record. I like a lot of punk bands, I like a lot of hardcore bands, but this record, this record is the record. And I still go to it. If I'm in a bad mood, this is it. I mean, this is this is just rage. It's just rage. And I, I just totally believe in this band. I really did. Um, I got to see Fugazi. I never got to see Minor Threat. Uh, I have seen Black Flag, uh, TSOL, Bad Brains, I've seen a lot of them. But this record just kills, it really does. Uh, and I think it was around 10th grade, I just pulled this record out at a record store and it looked really interesting to me. And I took it home and it blew doors for me. It was probably, it's definitely one of the influences on my own personal songwriting and music that I did. Uh, it's the Gun Club Fire Love. It's another record, debut record, uh, that is easily one of the best debut records I've ever heard. They never matched the power of this record. Basically, like, 
very blues oriented, but really punk, really LA punk hardcore. It, it doesn't really belong in that genre, but it definitely has that attitude all the way. Uh, I, I was lucky to get to see them live. So once I got out of high school, uh, I, like I said, I never lost the 50s groove and phase, and you know, listening to punk rock and all that got kind of stale. And I think by this time it was the late 80s, and I just started delving more and more into the back the background of the music and stuff. And because of my and like I said, I like all things 50s. So basically, uh, some of the records uh, that I have here are uh, a mix here. Uh, I got to see these guys too live uh, before their drummer died. Uh, it's The Ventures. And uh, this is a really great record. Um, I like all their music. Um, I think they're really underrated. They put out some like 30 records in their lifetime. Um, they're just known for Wipeout, which they didn't write. Walk Back Run, and that's it. These guys put out more surf instrumentals than anybody I know. And this is actually, I picked this one um, because it's the most psychedelic surf record. It's something that if you like psychedelic music, you know, it came out in the mid 60s when the, when the Beatles were out and stuff. It is, the whole thing is a very psychedelic record and it should be listened to. But uh, I have all their records at home. Um, and through them, I got into a band called the Astronauts. These guys were not even from California. They were like from somewhere out west, but not California. They were landlocked. They did Baja. Uh, I remember JFA, the punk band, did a copy, a version of Baja, and I had to get the original, and that's how I discovered these guys. And I have a couple of their records at home. Um, they're, they're not as good as Adventures, but they were really, really awesome. Um, and then this is where I'm hitting 19 or 20, and I, I'd already been in two hardcore bands, the Waltons and a band called Virginia Peace Corps, which only lasted maybe three or four shows, but the Waltons were a big one. Um, and this is around the time that I was thinking about starting a band that was not punk or hardcore, that I wanted to go in a different direction. And uh, I discovered this, uh, I thought, I this record store in Salem that did mail order, and I bought these two records, and I listened to these two records for a solid year. The first one being, the Johnny Burnett Trio, Terror Up. This was, this was my introduction I mean, to, there's something out there besides Elvis. Every song on here is just guttural, to the point, uh, rockabilly. Uh, I recommend it to everyone. As a matter of fact, the guy that owned the, uh, did the mail order service produced this record. Uh, it's kind of hard to find. And the other one was Link Ray and the Rain. Uh, this guy recorded everything on a four track. And uh, basically everything I have on here was from when he was with Swan Records. And it's amazing, he, he worked with family, he, uh, he recorded in a shed, and he recorded basically the first distorted guitar, I mean real distorted. Uh, Paul Burleson from the Burnett Trio uh, had some distortion, but this cat poked holes. He was also from Northern Virginia, D.C. area, which is kind of cool. Um, I, didn't, I didn't find out about that later, but songs like Jack the Ripper and Ace of Spades, and this whole record, Batman theme, nobody does it better, I'm telling you. Um, I, and I remember they had an interview with him, and he got turned down for uh, the original Batman TV series. But uh, I just couldn't stop listening to this in the Johnny Burnett trio. That was a year, and that filtered right down to the band I started called The Wanderers, who, a group of my friends, we were really serious about music, and uh, and I used pretty much everything that I've talked about. I was really influenced by New Wave, the Gun Club, hardcore punk, uh, but rockabilly was big, uh, and, and reverb guitar was big in my band, which kind of like made us unmarketable. Um, and I just want to, you know, I don't know how many people are going to see this video, but I got to give a shout out to Ronnie Self. Guy died young, wrote all his big hits for uh, Randall Lee's first record, um, and he just had a drug problem. I, I mean, his first fifties guy I knew of. I mean, I, I didn't know until later that Dion was a heroin junkie. The whole time he was doing run around suit, but uh, Ronnie Self had some serious issues, and he was his own worst enemy. But man, this guy did some blazing rockability. It's up there with Elvis and Burnett Trio. And because I love '50s music, and I, I think earlier I said something about West Side Story, um, I'm gonna pull out these. Um, my, I'm a big Sun Ra fan, um, but I. 
particularly like his 50s music when he was a big band. Um, it's real demented swing. It's like he took Duke Ellington and just flipped it around. This is my favorite record from Sun Ra. It's called Sound of Joy. Um, there's no jingling bells or 30 minutes of noise. Uh, a lot of people like the later stuff. But man, this, this swings. And, and it's jazz, and it, he had a great band that stayed with him. I mean, you know, some guys are hard to deal with, but these guys stayed with him, and they were like A1 players. So that was a big influence on me, and still is. Um, getting to the 60s again, I was really highly influenced by Indian Morcone of Spaghetti Western fame. Uh, I love his music. He's still alive. He's still doing it. Um, but, I mean, the way he mixed the harmonica, the reverb guitar, all that stuff, the, the noises in the background, big influence on Adam and the Ants, Kings of the Wild Frontier, which is another band that I really liked as a kid in junior high school with the Burundi beat added to it. it. That was a main influence on those guys. And then we get to why my show is called Dub Consciousness. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm just picking two out of it. Uh, Dub is uh, originally, uh, it's a Jamaican thing. A um, person would go in and cut a 45, vocals and everything else. Didn't have another song. So they would send it to these producers. Producers like King Tubby or Scientist, Yabby U, uh, or, you know. And what they would do is take that song and make a B-side out of the instrumentals. And they had such rudimentary equipment in Jamaica. Poverty, you know, all the way in Kingston. Um, they basically had to use what they had. And they created a modern sound that reverberates to this day. It's trippy. Uh, it's relaxing. Um, you know, some people like Enya. I don't. Uh, but these two records, uh, the re reaction and dub by the Revolutionaries and Scientists wins the World Cup. I'm by, by the way, I'm a soccer fan. Um, these records are like just they send you into a trance, and that um, not just these guys, but everything was a major influence on this show. It really was. If I did not listen to this kind of music, I don't think that my work would be quite like that. Um, I do do work off songwriting in my head because uh, I had to take up hardcore hiking to uh, alleviate the music in my head because I quit writing music at 32. But, and, and hiking and being in nature has been a big part of my life. And I think that I, until I took up art in 2013, I gave up music in 2000. I took up art in 2013, and uh, uh, hiking saved my life. I don't know what I would have done. Um, and it wasn't until my mother got ill that I started painting again. And of course, then I wasn't. It wasn't musically influenced. I got to give a shout out to my children. Um, they're both uh, two or nine, and one is eight. They introduced me to these bands. And I really, and I brought up the gorillas in one of my uh, paintings, but uh, believe it or not, I actually do like half of the, half of 21 Pilots, this album, not the other stuff. I don't like a lot of their stuff, but I like, I like a lot of the songs on this record. Um, and they, they also were influenced by reggae and dub, which is really weird, but I mean, they throw, I, I like the fact that they're throwing emo, uh, electronica, hip hop, uh, all, all this stuff, but they have that dub and reggae vibe to it. Um, and of course, what can I say about the gorillas? My kids got me into it, you know. Uh, someone had heard, I think my daughter heard Clint Eastwood, and that was it. So that's basically my music. And um, I will talk about how I got into art. Um, my mother was sick. Uh, I, we didn't think she was going to make it. Of course, she died later. And it was Christmas time, so I didn't know what to do. I wanted to get her a Christmas gift, so I painted a portrait of her. Not touched a brush since 1993. Um, it, was, it was very rudimentary, very folk art. Um, but it made her happy. And I mean, I painted it with all my heart. And I painted her studio. Her studio, you know, she was in the hospital for eight months. And I felt more comfortable going into her studio where I felt her positive presence. And I also felt my creativity come back. Because if you go from 2000, for 13 years, and you don't have a creative uh, kind of background, you lose your soul. I mean, if that's what you're meant to do. And so uh, I started painting in there. And uh, I wasn't very good. But yet, for some reason, I was weird and ambitious. And, and we'd find other artists, and I would start, we would start putting together group shows. 
And uh, I'll, I'm going to show you a piece of my early work that I painted in our studio. Uh, this one's called a uh, Zombie Football. Again, I'm a big uh, Premier League soccer fan. I teach. I, I'm actually coaching girls soccer this year. Um, but uh, I use humor to mask the pain I was feeling. I didn't want to do pain, which is strange, but um, somehow it, de it, it, it helps you uh, release. But this is called Zombie Football. And I was thinking of the movie I Walked with a Zombie. So I was going old school Haitian here. And this is your meager beginnings to what I've done now. Some people would say, well, why don't you start, just keep painting this way. Well, uh, maybe I will. But for right now, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. Thank you. This is my friend. C.J. Phillips or Carol Phillips. She is uh, a longtime acclaimed uh, artist here in Roanoke Valley. Um, besides my mother, she has been uh, a very big inspiration for me, and she's championed me. Once she saw that she wanted to champion me, because because when I first started, she probably would have said, K "Keep on painting, boy." Uh, but when she started seeing that my work was growing and I was getting better. Uh, I, she came to my aid so many times and worked very hard to help me uh, with this show, especially and with reactions. Also, she was friends with my mom, Mary Jane Birch. Uh, they know each other for years, and she was she and, and of course the other ladies were uh, essential in uh, doing curating, helping me curate and hanging because I had the flu. My mom's Lost Nudes uh, uh, show that was here uh, at Gallery 202. And um, I wanted her in this video because uh, she is probably one of the most, well, she's definitely one of the most original artists that I've seen. Um, and I, I also uh, call her the Goth Queen because her stuff has a lot of darkness to it. Uh, but um, she does wonderful stuff. And, um, and a lot of, kind of the same thing my mother was doing. My mother used a lot more color, but, um, uh, CJ uses a lot of dark black and whites and stuff like that, and uh, and there's nobody like her. There's nobody, you know, and um, and uh, so I just wanted her in here to thank her for everything that she's done for me, and her husband Oscar too. Uh, I mean, they came right after the fire, uh, you know, to my house and everything, and, and it just gives you an idea. And my children adore her. Uh, Little boy, I don't know about, but the both girls they come running, and that's that's a hard thing to do, by the way, CJ. But she's kind of become a surrogate mother to me. So, um, so what did you think of my show? I think that it was explosive. I think it was exciting, and I think it was very expressive. It expresses who Jim is. The music theme going through it is Jim, and I found it very exciting. The color was magnificent. And the response, so many people were here to see it, just knowing that Jim would do something that would be totally different. And he did. So I'm just thankful to know him as a friend. I think that he has a real future in the art world. And I'm just happy to mentor him and to help and just be there when he needs something. So I thank him for inviting me into this studio and my studio. Into and, your studio. Yeah, into my <laughs> studio. And uh, to have you film uh, some of the things I do, but also just to be here with Jim. And this is what she's like every day. I mean, I, the shoes. This is this is how my mom was in the 70s. I mean, these are people that work every day at their craft, you know. And I, I know that this, I mean, I, I love it, you know. Like, so when she's dressed up, I don't even recognize it, you know. <laughs> I, I know someone who has paint on their hands. On their on their clothes and uh, and I mean she's for real you know I mean she, I mean if there's people that take it seriously and there's people that don't you know and of course I'm I'm nice and clean um, but uh, I, I don't go around like I mean she's this is her life you know and uh, I'm so glad that she was a part of this 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 uh, short film that we're doing. Thank you, sweetie. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, kiss on the hand. <laughs> Thank you.